Today we're chapter 22 in, in view of the Lord's table. And uh, the whole concept, and we'll, we'll close with this idea too, that this what we did this morning should never be a matter of routine. I say I didn't have that great illustration, but you know, I've sat many times in services Actually, more specifically, I've seen this at funerals where communion was offered. And I'll see the people go through the line and get from the person at the front, and you can tell that they are just going through the motions. There, there's no real sense of, wow, this was great, this was important. It was go through the motions. And I hope that what we do on the first Sunday of every month is not merely a matter of routine. But I really pray that it would be a mindset of reflection for each one of us because that is so important. That's what the Scriptures teach us. Now, as we begin to address the theme that we have here, let's realize that there is a huge difference between practices that become routine rituals. Many times on Sunday morning, we'll drive away from the house, we'll get four blocks down the street, and I'll look at Donna and say, did we close the garage door? Or she'll say, did we check, you know, is the curling iron unplugged? Because there are certain practices that become routine rituals and you don't even remember doing it. And... There's that side of the fence, but then the other side is the priorities that should lead us to a sense of reverence. A sense of reflection of saying, oh, wow. And that's important for us to realize. That's just a fact of life. And when we consider the Lord's memorial, the Lord's Supper, Celebrating that should never become a routine ritual where we simply go through the motions. Or we eat the bread and drink the cup because it's on the schedule. I've even been in strong Bible teaching churches where I've heard that said. Well, it's communion Sunday. I guess we've got to do communion this week. That's unfortunate. It shouldn't be that way. Celebrating the Lord's Memorial Supper is serious business. Something that should never be taken lightly. And as we analyze the text this morning, as we look at the text itself, I'm going to read the text as we go through the study. But it's Luke 22, verses 7-30. through 30. I hope your Bibles are open. I hope you're ready to, to look and see. Because in this passage, the first thing that we noticed is that Jesus sent Peter and John what to prepare the Passover. And there's something kind of, kind of, well, kind of unique about this, kind of mysterious about this, as we see what happened. Now, now follow along as as I read this passage. I read this section. It says, "Then came the first day, the the initial time for." the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Notice that word had to be sacrificed. I think what Luke is saying is is that the Jews began to look at it as a ritual. It had to be done on that day. And that's what Luke, I think, is saying to us to some extent. Now Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us so that we may eat it. And they said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? And he said to them, when you have entered the city. We'll see this maybe in a couple moments as I, as I express this. But you enter the city, you realize the Passover in that day and age, by what it said in both Leviticus and in Deuteronomy, it had to be in the appointed city, which at that time was Jerusalem. So it had to be in Jerusalem. They had to go into Jerusalem to do this. So as you go into the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house that he enters, and you shall say to the owner of the house, 
the teacher says to you, where is the guest room which, in which we may eat, in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large furnished upper room. Prepare it there. And they left and found everything just as he told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, I think it's key for us to first just take a a peek at and and notice the sense of secrecy in this mysterious mission. Kind of like, remember the story, the the, the TV show Mission Impossible? For some in this room, you think, well, that's a movie. No, it was a TV show when I was a boy. And and they would go and they'd get this, this... special set of instructions, and they'd put it in the tape recorder, and when they got done, the tape, the tape would just disintegrate. That sense of secrecy. That's almost like what's happening here. Jesus, now, you go in the city, and somebody will, ca- will see you and follow him. Go into the house where he, where, where he enters. And there, you say to the, the owner of the house, we want to eat the Passover here. So there's this mysterious sense to it. And, and I mean, as it, that's what I just expressed right there. And I just want to show a few pictures. This is possibly what Jerusalem looked like. And notice what, you know, they, they enter Jerusalem and, and they walk through and they see a guy carrying a pitcher of water. And I mean, it could have been a house like that. Or it could have been one situation like that. Or very likely, and as I show this one, this gives the impression of possibly what an upper room would look like. Because chances are, the upper room that they're talking about there had an outside entrance. And it was a place where the disciples and Jesus could go and they would not necessarily be noticed. But at any rate, there's that sense of secrecy. And and understand something else. Normally, men didn't carry water pitchers. That was a lady's job in that day and age. That was not something that men often did. So obviously the disciples would notice right away, hey, he's the guy because he's carrying a water pitcher. And obviously, as we look at this passage and and understand context of the passage, what was there before, Judas had just made a deal with the the chief priests and, and and the Jewish leaders. He'd made a deal with them that he was going to betray Jesus. And obviously, Judas did not know the plan for the Passover celebration. He didn't know what was going on. And Jesus specifically, it's interesting here, he asked Peter and John, if we go back and look at the triumphal entry a few days prior to this, when Jesus went into Jerusalem on the colt, The Scripture doesn't tell us which disciples He sent to go get the colt. We don't know who it was. In this case, what did He do? He called on the two guys that He trusted the most. So He asked Peter and John specifically, and they went and they found it exactly. And that's just vividly portrayed in the text. In the Greek text, it says that they found it exactly as He explained. And they prepared for the Passover feast. And understand, this provides for us a a, a vivid picture of the Lord's sovereign control over things. Jesus was in charge. And He knew exactly what was going to happen. And now the preparation. In a sense, Luke gives us more information than any of the other Gospel writers. But yet, he doesn't give us any time frame for the preparation except the statement, the first day of unleavened bread. And I think it's important for us to understand that this was an elaborate meal. This was not something that you just put together on the, with a microwave. In fact, the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed, and then they had to make preparation, and then they had to roast the lamb. So it was an elaborate meal, it wasn't easy to prepare. And it included not only lamb, but other specific items that were part of the Passover meal. Part of the traditional feast. So, Peter and John get sent, and they didn't have an easy job. They had to go through the the whole preparation process for the Passover meal. 
Now, what was the customary practice during Jesus' day? I want to go through this very briefly, very quickly. I want to give you a picture of this. This is, this is good stuff. Because I think it's important for us to realize that it's based on Exodus 12 and 13. That's Israel's escape from captivity in Egypt. The nine plagues had already taken place. And that hadn't moved Pharaoh one bit in allowing the Israelites to leave the, the country. God had done all these various plagues and, and, and brought havoc upon the, the nation of Egypt. And Pharaoh didn't care. And God's plan all along was the nine plagues weren't going to do anything. He knew that. He wasn't caught by surprise. The tenth plague was the Passover where they would sacrifice the lamb. They'd put the blood on the doorposts of the house. In all the homes that did that, the oldest son would survive. In every home in Egypt, every single one where that wasn't done, whether it was Jewish or Egyptian, either one, the oldest son was killed during the night. So, it celebrates Israel's escape. And we could study that passage in Exodus 12 and 13 and in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and see all the things that are taught about the Passover. That's not our point this morning. But it's based on that. Secondly, it's an annual celebration. It's an annual celebration that recognizes the impact and the influence of Israel's roots as a people. It describes them as to who they were in God's eyes. And it points them back to what God did to rescue them from being slaves. Now, how did they get to Egypt in the first place? Just a quick reminder of that. They went to Egypt because Joseph, the son of Israel, the son of Jacob, he'd been sold into slavery. So he sold as a slave and the Egyptians end up buying him. He lands in Potiphar's household. He goes to prison because he's accused of something he didn't do. He gets out of prison and he works his way up to the point where he's second in command in Egypt. He's Jewish or he's, he's of Jacob's descent. He works his way up to the second in command in all of Egypt. And what happens? There's a famine throughout the whole region and Jacob's family goes back and they get food. Or they, Jacob's family goes to Egypt, they get food, and they're getting, the brothers are getting food from their brother that they didn't even know was their brother. And finally, Joseph says, hey, why don't you guys move the family? Bring dad. Bring everybody here. They land in Egypt, and they went from slave to second in command back down to slavery. And over the course of that time, what's happening as they're being slaves, their population was growing bigger than the Egyptian population. So there was a lot of tension in the land. And what happens? God says, I'm going to get you out of there. And He raises up Moses to do that. You know the story, I trust. But it's an annual celebration. And the Jewish people celebrated that year by year by year, remembering what God had done. It was a sacred setting. A couple things about that. They had to clean out all the yeast. Seven days. No, no yeast in the house. They could not have bread that rose. They could not have any leaven. They did no work except food preparation during those seven days. No foreigners were allowed to take the Passover. Only Hebrews. It was only in the designated place at this point in time. It was in Jerusalem. And Exodus proclaims this day as set apart for the purpose of commemoration. Completely set apart. That's literally the idea of sacredness. So that's, it was a sacred setting. We see that it was a family function. If you read through Exodus and Leviticus and you see how they did these things, it was intended to be a family function, a lasting ordinance for generations, it says. Intended to be celebrated with family, no foreigners, only Hebrews, and, and it was claimed to be you know, a day set apart. Same thing as I said before. 
It also was a symbolic reminder. A symbolic reminder. Throughout Israel's history, God used reminders to maintain a freshness for their faith. He used reminders to make their faith as fresh and as, as, well, revived as possible. And God placed emphasis on specific symbols used to remind the people of His goodness and grace. Just a quick list of what those things were. Some of the things God used, the stones from the Jordan River. The Ark of the Covenant. The feasts and the festivals is described in Leviticus. The animal sacrifices. The tablets of stone from Exodus 19 and 20. And afterwards, Exodus 32. And the tabernacle and the temple. We could have gone on with the list, but that's just some of them. Symbolic reminders. And it was also a teaching moment. With the initiation of the Passover in Egypt, God instituted a feast that included a memorial reminder, a symbolic emphasis, and a prophetic perspective. All three of those things symbolic emphasis, or a memorial reminder, symbolic emphasis, and prophetic perspective. Therefore, God's intention in this included an instructional tool. Teach the people using these things. An instructional tool designed to help His people understand His character. And God used all of that, and that's what was happening as Jesus said to the disciples, hey, go into Jerusalem and set up the Passover. Get it ready. So we see that. Now thirdly, let's understand something today. For Jesus, this Passover was very personal. It was very personal. It had a very high sense of personal meaning to the Lord Jesus Christ. I find it interesting that in the text it says that Jesus expressed to the disciples, I have earnestly and eagerly and just had such a strong desire. In fact, in Ancient Near Eastern languages, in the Greek language, in the Hebrew language, oftentimes what they do is they would use two the same word twice in a row to provide emphasis. In this passage, Luke uses the same word. Jesus had desire upon desire. Use the word desire twice in a row to say, I want to celebrate this Passover with you guys. And in that case, Jesus was eager, but then, middle of the night, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, and his his plight was in front of him. He realized they're going to come and arrest me soon, and I'm going to suffer. And what's Jesus doing in the garden that night? He's sweating drops of blood and, and, and basically crying out, God, if it's possible, take this cup from me. So on one hand, he's saying, I'm eager to celebrate the Passover and show you what it means. But then hours later, he's emotionally wrenched, so to speak, as he's recognizing what was in front of him. Very personal. Now notice the passage. It says, when the hour had come, he reclined at the table. His apostles were with him and he said to them, I have earnestly... I have desire upon desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will never eat it again, or I'll never eat it until I'll never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until the kingdom of God comes. He's saying, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Jesus was focused. His eyes were on the fact that soon he would face death and resurrection. So he saw that as he's saying, I earnestly desire to eat this before I suffer. 
He also, he used this as a significant teaching moment for the disciples. He wanted them to understand what his death meant. And what I find interesting in this text is that the disciples, they were moved over the fact that Jesus was leaving them. They were troubled by that, but there wasn't a sense of concern. They didn't seem to grasp the fact that Jesus had told them time and time again, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be tried, I'm going to be crucified. He had told them that. He started in Matthew 16 telling him that. Or he told them that in Luke chapter 9, 12, 13 chapters ago from here. And he used the supper meal as a significant teaching moment for the disciples. And it's interesting to see where he says next. He says, not only have I only desired to eat this, but I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled. What? In the kingdom of God. And his message for them continued to a sense of, or pointed to a sense of completion and closure. The final Passover focused, and this was the final Passover that was actually focused on Egypt. So this was the, the, the sense of completion. Now, did the Jews understand that completion? No, they didn't. But Jesus did, and this was the final Passover that was focused on the past. And He's saying to them, from now on, the feast will be focused on prophecy. Be focused on future. So what do we find next? Jesus redefined the purpose of the Passover. He redefined the purpose and He changed the perspective of what they were doing. And what do we see there? When we read the passage, it says, when He had taken some bread and given thanks, He broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is My body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And in the same way, He took the cup after they had eaten, saying, the cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant the new agreement between you and man, or between God and man, and it's in my blood. And he goes on and says, Behold, the one who is, the hand of the one who is betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them might be who was going to do this thing. Next section it says, I'm not going to read this, I'm just going to say that it expresses there, the disciples then began talking about one to one another, which one of us is the greatest? They, 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 they had this argument as to which one was the greatest, and, and what we find in this though, we see is that the bread, he took the bread, and when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And that symbolizes the body of Jesus Christ. What we took this morning symbolizes the body of Jesus Christ, and he is our substitute. I don't have an abundance of time to express this, but... I know that there are many different viewpoints that people come to the Lord's table with. Some people believe that in some mysterious way, that piece of bread literally becomes the body of Christ. And I personally don't believe that the text supports that concept. God's Word doesn't support the idea that, that there's some mysterious way in which that transforms to the body of Christ. I believe that it is purely symbolic in that regard. But yet I do believe there's a special presence that is involved in, in the communion celebration. I believe that it's a special presence and, and as we see that symbolic aspect of Christ, our substitute in the bread, 
you realize that it's all about substitution. And the symbolism of the bread is the bread substitutes for Jesus Christ in a sense too. But yet there's a special presence. God is here with us in a very special and and very unique way, I believe. Secondly, we see the cup. In the same way He took the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in My blood. That was a very special time in history because at that point in time, Jesus is saying, there's a new agreement that's starting between God and man. And it's no longer going to be year after year, the Day of Atonement and the Passover sacrifices. It's no longer going to be animal sacrifices that maintain a relationship with God. Instead, as it says in Hebrews, it's a once-for-all sacrifice And as there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood, the forgiveness comes through the shedding of of, of the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And His blood symbolizes the sacrifice for our sin. And as we put this all together, the Passover feast was a reminder in the past of God's goodness and grace. The new feast remains to be a reminder, but it is no longer focused on a system of temporary remedies for the problem of sin and the penalty of sin. It's no longer temporary. It says in Hebrews chapter 10 that Jesus Christ died once for all time. No other sacrifice is necessary. So, when we celebrate this, we're reminded of the one sacrifice that took care of sin forever. And with this, Jesus introduced the promise of the Passover. The promise of the Passover. Notice the passage. We read verses 28 through 30 of Luke 22. It says, Now you are those who have stood by me in my trials. As we read in the book of John, Judas had been dismissed. He was no longer with them. And it says, You are those who stood by me in my trials, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He says that to his disciples. We look back at verses 14 through 18 of 22. It says, When the hour had come, he reclined at the table, and the apostles were with him. He said to them, I have earnestly, I have just so deeply desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled. It is completed. It is satisfied in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup, not the cup that we took, but another cup, an extra cup in the Passover meal, he took a cup and he gave thanks and says, take this and share it among yourselves, for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. As my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant to you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. His message for the disciples emphasized a promise. Emphasized a promise. He went on and he says, I tell you, I'll not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. The message for them pointed to the promise of resurrection from the dead. But also the coming kingdom of God. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, as we see what Paul writes, and notice what it says there. Paul says himself, he says, I received from the Lord. I got this from Jesus Myself. 
And I'm passing it on to you, he says, that the Lord on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and after he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and every time you drink it, in remembrance of me. Notice verse 26. For every time you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, what? Until he comes back. Until he comes back to set up his kingdom. And Christ is coming to set up a kingdom. And, and now, you say, tell me about it. Well, I don't have that much time. Not merely because of the clock here, but I don't have that much time to tell you all the things that are recorded in the Scriptures about the kingdom that's coming. But what I can tell you is that God promised I'm in charge. I'm not caught by surprise by anything that happens in this world where you live. And I believe... I believe this book when it says that God has a plan for the church. God has a plan for Israel. And God is going to set up a kingdom in the future. And that kingdom will last. The first kingdom will last a thousand years. And after he does a little more house cleaning, so to speak, Read the book of Revelation, the end of book of, the end of the book of Revelation, you'll see he sets up a kingdom that lasts a thousand years. Then he takes a pause to get rid of, as they say, house cleaning. He gets rid of all the enemies. And then he sets up an eternal kingdom that lasts forever. And we can say we have a God that knows what he's doing. He has today our future in His hands. I look at the election cycle. I look at what's going on in our country. I look at what's going on in our world. And sometimes I can have a sense of fear and trepidation. There's no need for that. God's in charge. He knows what He's doing. He knows what's going to happen. He's got it all planned out. And we need not be anxious. We really need to anticipate God's sovereignty. And as we close today, as we apply the truth, we've, we've addressed the theme today and saw where certain practices can become rituals and routines, and that's not good. Rather, we should have priorities that prompt us toward reverence and reflection. We've analyzed the text and we've seen that God had a, a, a very specific symbolic memorial for us to consider. And I believe that in the celebration of the Lord's table, there is a sense of growth that happens in our lives if we take it properly. That's what the text says. And as we apply the truth to our lives, what difference should it make to my life? Three things with a couple of different editorial comments. First off, the Lord's Supper. The celebration of the Lord's Supper is a symbolic reminder of the sacrifice the Lord Jesus made. It's a symbolic reminder for all of us. And it keeps us in check, so to speak. Jesus took the penalty and the punishment each one of us deserves because of our sinfulness. And the communion meal should prompt for us a sincere sense of reverence and respect. It should prompt for us a sincere sense of humility and honor for the Lord. We should see Him in His presence in this. And our lives should be affected by the fact that 
Jesus Christ is the sacrifice made for me. Secondly, the Lord's Supper celebration is a specific reminder that Jesus will come again to establish His kingdom. And there's that specific reminder, and Jesus promised that He would return. He said, I'm coming back. The angel at his ascension expressed the fact that Jesus would return. It says that Jesus was caught up in the cloud and he, he went in, the disciples watched him. And there's an angel standing there and he says, why are you guys looking in the sky? This Jesus will come back in the same manner in which he left. And communion should prompt within me a sincere sense of anticipation. Not anxiety, but anticipation and hope for His coming. Remember when, in the days when I was a youth pastor, had lots of different young people that would say things that would you know, grab you and you'd have to bite your tongue not to laugh or whatever else. One night, one of the young people, one of the young ladies in the youth group, she, we're, we're going through prayer requests right at the end of our meeting, and she says, Pastor Greg, let's pray for the Lord's coming. Let's pray for, for, for Him to come back. Wouldn't that be exciting? And this one kid got his terror-struck look on his face. He said, no! In two months, I get my driver's license. <laughs> well, you know... There's that, that next week our daughter's getting married. If the rapture happens in the middle of this week, is that going to be a bad thing? No. But when we celebrate the Lord's table, there should be this sense of anticipation and hope for His coming. There should be a desire and devotion that we might serve the Lord faithfully. And finally, when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, my faith and hope should be strengthened and encouraged. There should be a strengthening. There should be an encouragement because we recognize He's my sacrifice. He's my substitute. He's my coming King. And as we consider that, our desire to be obedient, our commitment to follow His example should be increased. Communion should remind us of His spiritual presence in our lives. His spiritual presence that goes with us wherever we go. Our hope should be focused on His provisions for us and His promises to us. And our faith should be stronger. And as we close, we just have to express the fact that the Lord's Supper celebration should never be simply a matter of ritual or routine. Routine or ritual. It should never be just simply that. It should always provide in us a mindset for reflection and reverence. Let's pray as, the, as Mary and Bethel and Tia come up to lead us in the last song. Our Father, I thank You for the reminder of what Christ has done. And again, I ask this morning that You might meet us here in a way that we wouldn't necessarily expect. That You might help us rearrange our priorities if that's needed. That You might help us to have a reverent respect for Your presence in our lives. That we might stop and, and analyze those different activities, those, those habits or routines or rituals that have become so much a part of our lives that we don't even think about them. 
It may be the celebration of your memorial supper. It may be some sin that has become so prevalent in our lives that we don't even think about it. I pray, God, that you might root out those things in a way that strengthens our walk with you. That allows us to be an example to those around us of what you desire. We can't do that on our own, Father, but we can with your help. And I pray that you might help us today in these areas. Again, thank you for every person here. Thank you for every decision that's being made personally and privately today in in our hearts and in our minds. Lead us as we prepare to close this service. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.